Well, hello again, everyone. So, so happy to be with you all today. And again, welcome to all of you who are watching online. Let's, jo let's go to our God with a brief word of prayer as we begin and we pray. Dear Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts today be pleasing in your sight. For you, you are our God, our refuge, and our strength, our rock in this changing world. Amen. Well, dear friends, today we continue working our way through the words of the Apostles' Creed because the words of the Creed summarize for us the main teachings of the Bible. They tell us who our God is, that he is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they tell us what our triune God has done for us, right? And, and in this world where there are so many different and vague and conflicting ideas about God, the words of the creed help to bring clarity around those essential truths around which all Christians can and should agree. Because our Christian faith isn't, isn't just a, like a belief in belief. In other words, it, it's not just like our feelings about things which, let's be honest, our feelings in life, our feelings change. Over time, they, they come and they go, right? That, those are feelings. But our Christian faith is rooted upon and built upon the facts of who our God is and what our Savior God has done for each and every one of us. And today, especially, we see in the heart of the creed, our confession of faith is belief in Jesus, that he is the Son of God and the Savior of us sinners. So last week, we kind of got to celebrate Christmas in July, when we looked at the, the words of the creed that say, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. And we talked about how this miraculous virgin birth makes Jesus in his divinity and in his humanity, how it makes Jesus uniquely qualified to be the savior of our human race. And it, it, it's hard not to, 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 you know, love Christmas, right? It's hard not to love that picture of Jesus, you know, like baby Jesus in the manger, asleep on the hay, the silent night, holy night, joy to the world, and, and, and Mary pondering up all these things in her heart. But what we're talking about today as we continue working our way through the creed is all entirely different, isn't it? The, the, the mood of the creed shifts altogether. Right? He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. That, that was all well and good last week. But now we come to this phrase in the creed that says, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. There is something heartbreakingly final about being buried, isn't there? Who of you, over the last couple of weeks, hasn't been perhaps even moved to tears watching the just unfolding tragedy just down the road here in Surfside? Right? That condo building has become a pile of rubble. Sadly, this week, they, the officials announced they, they've moved, they've, they've shifted gears from the, the rescue effort to more of just a recovery effort now, right? Which is an acknowledgement that what, what that is, that pile of rubble has essentially become a tomb, a place where they're recovering dead bodies, right? It's just heartbreakingly, tragically sad. The loss of life, a place that's so beautiful, right? And on the beach overlooking the ocean in such a beautiful place where people lived, it's become a place where people are buried. Now, that's not the kind of place that you'd ever expect to find the Son of God, is it? I mean, dead and buried in a tomb. Right? Like, what human brain, what human imagination would come up with that as the plan of it all? That, that God's own son would, would have to suffer and die and be buried. No human imagination would come up with a plan like that. Right? None of us would invent it. Like, if you were just to invent a religion of your own and hope that people would follow you and it would grow and expand and, and take over the, the, the whole world, you wouldn't come up with one that says the hero is the one who is humiliated and crucified, and then his followers all run off into the night and 
a stone shuts him up and it's all over. Especially in the mighty Roman Empire, the heart of it all, Caesar is Lord and all that kind of stuff that this place that where people valued as their highest core values, you know, power and might, and the Romans perfected the art of crucifying their victims to show that they are in control and they are strong. You never come up with a plan that says the hero of your religion is one who in utter powerlessness and hopelessness ends up humiliated and crucified of all things. But that is exactly the truth that the Apostles' Creed reminds us of when it comes to Jesus. That amazingly, the Son of God himself suffered, died, and was buried. Because from beginning to end, this was God's rescue plan to save sinners. And, and through it all, he was in control. That from beginning to end, Jesus came into this world. From the very moment that he came into this world, he was on a mission a mission sent by his Father to accomplish nothing less than our full redemption from, from the curse and consequences of all of our sins. And that from the very beginning, in fact, before the beginning of time, Jesus, he willed this to happen as well in full agreement with his Father. Jesus says this a number of times in the Gospels. Here's, here's one section in John chapter 10 where he reminds us of this fact. He says, The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. So today we're, we're moving from that joy to the world, Christmas, to the horrifying events of Jesus' crucifixion. These words of the creed where we confess he, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. Now that last point about Jesus' burial is, is mentioned in the creed because it, it's just a, a well-attested historical fact. I mean, the the Roman soldiers, the Roman government, the Jewish leaders, everybody was in agreement on these core facts that, that Jesus of Nazareth, he, he was in fact crucified, he was in fact dead, and the final proof of it all was that he, he was buried. A Roman executioner's spear pierced Jesus' heart sack when he was on the cross which caused an outflow of blood and water, thus definitively proving that he was, in fact, dead. A lot of people died just after the flogging and the loss of blood and everything else. Jesus was, he was dead. And then later that afternoon, his mangled, lifeless body was, was laid inside a tomb. And that tomb was sealed shut and guarded by professional Roman soldiers who were tasked under the penalty of death to keep that tomb secure. So those, of course, are just the, the historical facts of it. That all happened. But the questions for us to consider then are, well, what does that all mean? And what does that mean for us? Right. And that's where this, this conversation between between Pilate and Jesus is so helpful and so important. It helps us to explore these questions today so that we can, we can begin to understand a little bit more clearly kind of what I was talking about with the kids up here before, this amazing truth, that God's love transforms the awful into the wonderful. So here again are, is the first part of this conversation from John chapter 18. Pilate then went back into the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He says, Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Well, am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you've done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. Well, you are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. In fact, 
The reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. <laughs> what is truth? retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again to the Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. But it's your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, no, no, not him. <laughs> Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. And then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. Right, and so this back and forth conversation is what carries on the event so that Jesus wasn't just flogged, but of course, later that afternoon, soon he's going to be nailed to the cross too, where he's going to slowly suffocate and suffer excruciating pain and then, and then finally die. Right, but, but to get it, of course, to get at what, the, what does this all mean? Why did this all have to happen? We, we, we should pay close attention to what Jesus says because this, con, con, uh, this conversation is is important. Jesus says that everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Right? Everyone on the side of truth listens to Jesus, his word, and what he says. And of course, Pilate, he's got this kind of snarky reply. He's a fool. What is truth? You know? But let's be honest, that, that's a pretty important question Pilate asks, isn't it? I can't really tell what, what his motives were, what, what's, going on, what's going through his head, but but it is an important question for us to ask, especially as we, we get to this part of the Apostles' Creed. And we, we, we make this confession and we say, I believe he was, he was crucified, died, and was buried. You know, well, what, what is the truth of all that? What does that mean for you and for me? What does it matter that a, that a, a man of Jewish descent named Jesus, some 2,000 years ago, suffered and died and was buried? Like, why should you care? Well, the first, the first thing we're going to see here, just like, this, is, this is what the creed is really getting at, you know? This is like the, the theological importance, you might say, underneath just the historical facts of it. Like, what does that all mean? <laughs> right? Because it, it's the truth that each of us must, must personally believe about what Jesus actually did there on the cross, or else you won't receive the blessings of what he accomplished there. So it's kind of important. What is the truth of all that? Well, Jesus helps us to understand that. And the first part of the truth that Jesus came to bring is just this. The truth is, there are no, quote unquote, good people. That's actually, that's the awful truth of God's law to which the suffering and death of Jesus, God's son, testifies. You, you realize that? Now, I, I know we, we don't tend to think that of ourselves especially, right? We, we tend to think of ourselves, eh, me too, right? I'm a pastor. Like, good people, right? Like there's this part of your heart that cries out, well, I'm a good person, right? It, it, especially when we compare ourselves to people that are out there that we, we think are really bad, right? Or else if you, you maybe kind of just like think of God as a caricature and you think of him like, he, like he's sort of like a, a pushover kind of teacher, that's just going to kind of let you get away with stuff. He's going to pass you along anyway because, you, you know, or he grades on the curve and, and you're going to be in the upper part of it. And, you know, in our world today, it's easier than ever to be like this. You know, now we can just race to social media, whip out our phone, and we can express our outrage instantly about whatever it is that those people are doing or aren't doing out there that we consider is necessary for people to be, like, righteous, in, in our sight, right? Like, like those people out there who don't wear face coverings in certain places or those people who won't get vaccinated or just like, like whatever it is, right? We can quickly go and we can express our outrage and then what, what happens, we can feel good about ourselves. How noble we are, how loving we are, how just we are compared to those other people who either do or don't do these things. Right? And so you can, you can actually make up your own socially acceptable rules, perhaps which are already convenient to the lifestyle choices that you've determined you want to make according to your feelings. And then you can kind of like look down upon and savagely condemn and judge other people who don't keep those rules, the rules which you've made up, which you can keep. 
And then you can look down on people for breaking those rules. Never mind, really, what God's laws or commands actually say. Just find a few people that already agree with you on the things that you've determined are important for, for righteousness. Express outrage together at the people who don't do those things. Then you'll always have somebody to, like, pat you on the back, hit the like button on your posts, and generally make you feel incredibly good compared to all those other really bad people that are out there. Well, what, what, you know what that shows? Modern people haven't solved sin, have we? We've just gotten clever at giving in to our own innate sinful nature's desire to justify ourselves. That's the basic human religious impulse, to justify ourselves in the sight of God on our own. But there's a big problem with that. Here's what the Bible says. It says about all people, it says, there is no one righteous, not even one. That is the clear, consistent message of both the Old and New Testament. There's no one good in the sight of God because you know what? God is holy. He is righteous. And we are not. We are sinners. You know, Pontius Pilate, he kind of imagined that he could just like wash his hands clean of condemning an innocent man to die, granted to save his own skin, his own selfishly motivated political interests, right? He wanted to protect all that. So he thought he could just like wash his hands of it all and then it would go away and, and it would all be good, right? But it doesn't work like that. You, you and I can't just be good enough on our own and then just kind of like wash our hands clean of, of all of our own selfishly motivated thoughts and words and deeds and then just think that it's going to be all good with God. Like not even going to church and being religious, right, makes a person right in the eyes of God. Because if it did, I mean, just think about it. Like if, if, if righteousness could be through what you do, then why would the Son of God himself come into this world so that he could suffer and die and go to a cross if people were good enough on their own, right? But he did. Willingly, lovingly, amazingly, Jesus did. And purely because he loves you. And so that brings us to the second truth. Here's what 1 Peter 3.18 says. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Well, this passage and, a, and dozens of other passages in the Bible make this so beautifully clear. Jesus volunteered to be punished in the place of sinners who could never deserve such a gift. The, the only truly good one, the only righteous one, and what was he willing to do? To trade places with us. Right? He who, in his thoughts and words and deeds, was, was 100% pure, perfectly sinless, he was willing to take the place, the, the righteous one, in place of all unrighteous people. Right? And so think about it. Like he who is sinless, the Son of God, he said, I will go and I will, I will suffer physically, yeah, emotionally, and, and the, the spiritual torments of hell. Jesus suffered so that you and I wouldn't have to. Now that's love, isn't it? He suffered for the, the sins that you and I have committed so we wouldn't have to. And that includes all of our own pathetic attempts, right, at self-justifying ourselves in the sight of God on the basis of our own supposed goodness. I mean, before Pilate and on the cross, Jesus, like, he, he could have, like, they were, they were mocking him, but Jesus, he could have called upon a, a legion of angels who would have come and defended his just cause, right? And yet he remained silent. Because he embraced the penalty for sins which you and I deserved. And he was going to drink that cup of God's wrath all the way to the bitter end. And purely because he loves us. And friends, this is why God's love transforms the awful into the wonderful. 
Martin Luther once said this. He said, if you see yourself as a little sinner, you will inevitably see Jesus as a little Savior. You get that? Could that be... Could that be why sometimes we don't perhaps appreciate the sacrifice that Jesus made as much as we should? Right? Because, friends, if you, if you think your sins are kind of like no big deal, they're not really that bad, or you're sort of good enough on your own, and you can kind of take care of the thing, or you just kind of keep doing what you're doing, it's just fine, you know, God doesn't really care. I just want you to think a little bit in your mind about Jesus on the cross, Right? Think about the, the pain for a moment. Take it in. And the blood and the suffering. And hear him cry out the, the torment of, of the damned when he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he suffers your hell. You see, friends, that, it just, you know, human reason cannot comprehend this fact that we deserve such a fate. But that is what Jesus took our just punishment. The the wrath of God, the just anger and wrath of God is what Jesus endured, and he endured it willingly for you and for me. Right? That's awful what he endured. But the wonderful good news of it is that he willingly endured all that. What he didn't deserve. So that you and I could get what we don't deserve which is the beauty of of his righteousness, freely given to you and to me as a gift. And so so we confess in the creed, we say, I believe, right? And by faith in Jesus, what, what happens is we receive everything that Jesus accomplished through that incredible sacrifice that he made there in our place, the forgiveness of our sins and a right relationship with God. I believe. And we receive all those gifts. Right, so the, the, the cross, this, this awful reminder of what, you know, sin's penalty is, can be now also for us who believe the, the, the proof and the extent of our Savior's love. This verse again that I shared earlier from Romans It says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, like we weren't good people, we were sinners, Christ died for us. And so in so doing, what did Jesus do? He he satisfied God's justice. He he satisfied and fulfilled God's anger, his his punishment that we deserve. And so it, you know, it's done. It was and it still is finished. There's nothing more to do. And that means, friend, that you, you are forgiven. Fully and freely for Jesus' sake. Okay, and so, so being a Christian or, or like being on the side of truth, like Jesus put it. Right? Being on the side of truth doesn't, doesn't mean just trying to, to like make sure other people see you as being like the right type of person. I mean, this is such good news, right? It, it doesn't mean you need to get people to look at you and, just, and to think of you like, like oh, you're, you're, like, you're a good person. Okay? Or you're a religious person. Or, or a successful person. Or a, a woke person. Or a person who votes according to a certain political party line or something like that. Or any other category that people put themselves into in order to feel better about themselves compared to other people who aren't in that category. You see, being a Christian means believing Jesus when he tells you the truth about your sin and the truth about the full redemption that he accomplished when he took the curse of sin and all of its consequences away so that God could call you his dearly loved child. So believe in Jesus when in the gospel he says he loves you. When in his word he tells you that through holy baptism your sins have been washed away. And when in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper he gives you his true body and blood and he says this 
This is for you, for the forgiveness of all your sins. I hope, friends, you see it's really good news that God doesn't just love, quote, unquote, good people. But that instead he loves people who acknowledge that they're sinners. But sinners who trust in his amazing grace given to us freely for Jesus' sake. Who went to the cross and bore our suffering and carried away the guilt of our sins. You know, in the Bible, there, there was a man, he, he, he was a jailer, and he was in total despair about, about to kill himself. He was ready to commit suicide. Until he asked the question, what must I do to be saved? You know what I mean? That's really kind of like the question that every religion tries to answer in the world, right? And they all have different ways of doing it. Like, well, you know, the five pillars in Islam, and here's what you're supposed to do, and these are the, the prayers you're supposed to say, and all this stuff. It's all just about, like, what do you have to do? And, and this man, he's asking the question, what do I have to do to be saved, right? And he's, he's crushed under a load of guilt, and he's in despair. Well, what answer does he receive? Well, thankfully, he, he's not told, well, look, first, first you need to, to prove that you're actually worthy after all that you've done. You know, first, what you have to do is, is you, have to, you have to figure out how you're going to make up for all that, that you've ever said and done and all the bad that you've committed. No. Instead, he heard this amazing, wonderful, good news. Believe in Jesus and you will be saved. Why? Well, because Jesus did it all. And for him, and for you, there's nothing more to do. And so by God's grace, the jailer believed. He believed in Jesus. He believed the gospel. And the Bible says he was filled with joy. So God took a really awful situation for him, and he turned it into something wonderful. And so, friends, today I hope you see the cross of our Savior Jesus is what shows us God's love and how God's love transforms the awful into the wonderful for us too. Amen. May the peace of God that surpasses all our human reason, may that peace guard and protect your hearts through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen.